All right. Thanks, everyone, for jumping in. Uh, thanks, Sid, for volunteering to give this uh, webinar and presentation. I think a lot of us are uh, kind of confused about how this whole thing works, so that will be a great presentation. I'll be recording it and sharing it on our Slack for all the, the other people to also uh, get some context. So this is going to be one hour webinar, 30 minutes presentation, 30 minute Q&A. Um, and I'll let Sid uh, start and kick off. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone, or maybe not morning for everyone. But uh, so uh, briefly, uh, you know, I'm a computer programmer. I live in um, New York City and uh, I work mostly in neuroscience. But uh, I've also worked with genetic sequence analysis and this is I've got interested in this. So uh, now I will present this uh, talk about how COVID works. The presentation is assuming that you know, you don't know anything about biology, uh, but I, uh, you know, it, it will go a bit into some biological details, but definitely for a person who has no background at all, that person can also uh, understand, uh, I hope. And feel free to interrupt, otherwise there's a 30 minute Q&A at the end. So I will start, I will uh, share my screen and I will show you the PowerPoint. Uh, so, um, I, I just share the screen, which is, uh, It's asking me to open the system preferences and share, but uh, I, I'll just do that. Okay, that's fine. Um, I have to restart Zoom because uh, of the uh, security preferences. No but, Go ahead. Okay. Technology, it always happens. Do we have people here that know anything about how? We just have to. All right, Sid, you're back. All right, I think you're muted. Okay, you're good. Uh, no, uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, so the uh, the um, outline of the talk is uh, as Arthur uh, had mentioned. Um, I will talk about the overall points. Would be how the virus enters the cell, how it multiplies, then what leads to the immune reaction. And uh, then in severe cases, there's this multi-organ stress and failure. And then just what are the four major drug targets? And in the end, I'll come back to, uh, again, how the virus actually works, which is the genetic origins and uh, uh, you know, essentially identify like how we can uh, better find a treatment and target the virus. So uh, those of you who, uh, I mean, most uh, uh, who have some biology background would know this, but uh, otherwise, like this is how a cell works. A cell has a DNA, which is the genetic material, which codes for, you know, what the cell makes. And the DNA is inside the nucleus. And the DNA is translated, uh, uh, sorry, transcribed into something called RNA, which is pretty much, uh, it's, it's, it is the set of instructions. Uh, and then uh, it's the same as the DNA, but that uh, RNA goes outside of the nucleus to the cytoplasm, which is uh, the region outside the nucleus in the cell. And there it is converted uh, to a protein by a machine called the ribosome. So the DNA is a set of instructions um, to make something, say a plane, and the RNA is a copy of the instruction, and the ribosome is the machine that reads the instruction. So this is how a regular, like uh, the cells in our body work. And uh, this is how, uh, this is uh, that shown diagrammatically. So you can see the DNA on one side and the DNA becomes RNA and the RNA uh, becomes uh, this protein. I mean, this is uh, not 
I mean, there are other things that can happen. And one of uh, you see, like this reverse transcription RNA can be become DNA. RNA can be amplified to uh, more RNA, and and that's one uh, something the virus will be using. We'll see that quickly. So, what is the? How is the virus different? The virus is just the RNA or the DNA. There are two kinds of viruses: the RNA viruses or the DNA viruses. And the coronavirus is a uh, kind of RNA virus. It's um, uh, and, and this specific virus is a beta coronavirus. There are alpha, beta, gamma, delta coronaviruses. But so it's just the RNA and, and uh, some proteins and a shell around it. So it doesn't have the ribosome or the machinery, which is, uh, you know, a ribosome is, uh, it, it think of it as a printing press and, and uh, you know, like the paper and, and other equipment to just make copies of itself. It needs some it needs another cell to make a copy of itself. So it has to enter a host cell and hijack the resources to make a copy of itself. And this is a diagram that I've again borrowed from the internet. So the virus, uh, uh, in this case like COVID, it binds to a receptor, then it comes, uh, it, uh, 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 then it also manages to, after binding it come, enters the cell. Uh, and then once it enters the cell, it releases the RNA. And the RNA uh, does two things. One is that it makes more copies of the RNA because, uh, you know, the virus is two things, the RNA plus the shell. So you need, 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 uh, if you are going to make more viruses, you need more uh, copies of the RNA and more copies of the shell. And the shell is made up of uh, uh, several things like proteins and some fat and uh, other things. So uh, the, the virus, uh, it uses the, uh, the system of the ribosome to uh, uh, create proteins from the RNA. And then it also, uh, uh, it, it, it uh, creates the uh, more copies of itself using something called uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. What that means, uh, and I will come to that again uh, quickly now, uh, a bit later, is that uh, it uh, RNA is like a polymer. Uh, it is like a set of kind of repeating uh, um, uh, elements. I mean, they're slightly different elements. But uh, it is some, in some sense a polymer, and then uh, uh, this uh, uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is an enzyme that takes that uh, a template uh, RNA and then makes more RNA. So that's why it's RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, oh, what happened there? Uh, somehow, like the it, it's <laughs> if I go into the presentation more, it skipped a lot of it. Okay, uh, then, um, yeah, so I, I'll go back into presentation mode. So the a virus, it binds to this specific receptor, uh, SARS-CoV uh, does, and uh, every cell in the body has many kinds of receptors, and all these receptors are not there in all the cells of the body, because uh, what a receptor is, is essentially, a docking or a signaling station, like typically some um, uh, molecule will come and bind to the receptor and that usually leads to uh, secondary changes inside, like uh, somebody knocks on your door and then depending on the knock, there are some changes that happen inside a building, but that person doesn't come in, you know. And, and, and then, uh, but there are other receptors uh, which are like in uh, nerve cells where like uh, a gate will open and some other, uh, you know, molecule might come in. But but for the most part, a receptor is, is that. And it binds uh, to this specific receptor called the angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE2 receptor. And this receptor is present in many cells and among them, like it's the tongue has it, which is one of the reasons like it can enter through the mouth. And it also is there uh, in the, what's called the type two pneumocyte in the alveoli in the lungs. Now what this uh, is, uh, ACE is uh, angiotensin two, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme uh, is an enzyme that essentially regulates blood pressure by converting something called angiotensin 2 to angiotensin. This is naturally occurring in the body. And uh, this uh, enzyme binds to this receptor and this receptor is uh, present in the alveoli. So what is the alveoli? When you, uh, when uh, the lung, the airway, it branches into many parts and uh, like in the smallest end, like it's like a set of balloons, like you see like those birthday balloons. So that's essentially like the alveoli, really thin uh, membrane, uh, like kind of balloons where there is a gas exchange with the surrounding capillaries and, and the blood. 
uh, these alveoli have two kinds of cells. One kind of cell is the um, uh, what's called the type one pneumocyte, where which does the gas exchange. It allows oxygen to uh, come in from the air and into the blood, and the other one uh, and, and like carbon dioxide uh, comes out. So this is a gas exchange. The other one creates uh, what's called the lung surfactant. This is this uh, chemical that essentially. Uh, it reduces the decreases of tension and essentially keeps the uh, balloon there. And, and if like, the balloons use some surfactant, uh, there's some kind of powdery stuff inside that you might have seen. So uh, this protein has chosen, uh, sorry, to uh, bind to this receptor. And uh, of course, it uses another docking protein called TMPRSS2, which again, like is important because that could be a target. And uh, it uses these two proteins, but most importantly, it has learned this trick to really bind very well to this uh, ACE2 receptor. SARS-CoV, like SARS, which came in 2003, also was binding to the ACE receptor, but not as efficiently as this one. This one has, it does it like better than anything uh, we could even think of. So uh, after binding, it uh, manages to uh, kind of uh, get in the cell and then release its uh, RNA. And this RNA, again, like uh, there are many kinds of RNA uh, that viruses uh, can have. And it's, uh, this one is a single-stranded RNA, just a single strand of RNA. And it's a positive, uh, uh, it, you can think of uh, uh, every kind of uh, polymer like a DNA or RNA uh, has uh, two ends. It's a five prime end or three prime end as they say and uh, they are chemically a bit different and and uh, uh, but uh, a positive strand goes positive rna goes from 5 prime to 3 prime so but um, here the uh, the virus is uh, like this is the spike protein and this is this is the really important part that people have been trying to understand like what is it that makes this spike protein bind to this ace receptor so effectively and then uh, you know the what what are the changes the virus made this is like a big part of the changes the virus has made but let's get uh, we'll come back to you know what it has done to get so far uh, but let's see like what happens next so just a brief uh, diagram like this is like like kind of monster or a dark lord has come with the spike protein and it's pretty much stabbed us with this but so the uh, the rna comes in and then it is uh, um, the RNA, uh, the two things can happen to it. One, it is duplicated by this RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So you make more RNA. And the RNA is also used by this ribosome, which is this translation machinery to make more um, uh, the proteins. But again, like the viruses use very different strategies on how this RNA is read. Uh, for say us, like uh, typically we have uh, a, a genetic code where like every three letters of the RNA codes for a specific protein and then you have one gene that makes one protein. I mean, that's a very uh, crude uh, way of saying it. It's, it's not necessarily true, but for the most part, you have uh, one gene that, uh, you know, it codes for a protein which can be modified later. So you read three letters of that RNA and you read three letters and then you, you make the protein. Uh, every three letters correspond to an amino acid which makes a protein. But what the virus does is that it makes it, since it's got this one RNA, it makes a long kind of uh, protein, which is called a polyprotein. It's a sum of many proteins, and that has to be cut into parts to make this individual proteins that will go to make up the virus. For example, the spike protein is one of them. Then there are other structural proteins that are there on the membrane, uh, M protein, E protein, envelope protein. And then there is this what's called the nucleocapsid protein. The RNA itself is coated with the protein. So so but uh, what happens is it the virus uh, makes this long protein it cuts it into parts again it uses uh, some of the cells machinery it uses some of its own proteins to cut it uh, and then uh, it take it assembles it in certain centers called assembly centers and then you have all these viruses they get released and, and this pretty much is the is, is the same uh, diagram that I had shown uh, and this is the diagrams i had sent out so uh, I just, um, you know, wanted to uh, show uh, show it here too. So the virus enters the cell, and then the virus binds to this type one, uh, sorry, type two. The uh, type one pneumocyte, uh, pneumocyte is for the gas exchange, and the type two has the ACE receptor. The type one does not have the ACE receptor, but this is the one the virus binds to. 
So uh, it, it, it has a spike protein and then uh, it uh, binds and then it enters the cell. Now, one, when it enters the cell, as you see, like two things are happening. It uses the RDRP, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, to make more of the RNA. And then it uses the ribosome to make this polyprotein, P1, P2, like this long chain. And then there's this protease that cleaves this polyprotein and creates this P1 and P2. And so you've got the RNA, you've got the proteins, and you've got everything that you need to kind of, uh, you know, package the virus and you make more packets of the virus. And the vi these viruses, they start leaving the cell. So obviously, this is not a happy situation for the cell. It's uh, like, you know, you've got this printing press and somebody's coming in at night and making like, you know, many copies of uh, itself, sort of. Uh, so what the, uh, this, uh, there, are, uh, there are detection mechanisms in the cell which can detect uh, an intruder. So it sets off alarms. And, and of course, like the virus, what is not shown here has uh, ways to kind of turn off these alarm mechanisms for a while. That's that is what makes viruses lethal because if you've got an alarm that rings quickly that you know something is wrong then uh, it, it, uh, you know you'll get uh, the cops and uh, all the immune system will arrive and knock it out very quickly but the virus can delay it for a bit um, but anyway like uh, these signals get released and uh, we have uh, two kinds of immune uh, system responses one what's called the innate response the other is called the adaptive response the innate response is it just goes for any kind of intruder it just shoots first and you know asks later uh, but like uh, but the adaptive response is specific to different kinds of um, intruders uh, and that's where you know vaccines and other uh, ways to treat uh, intruders uh, come in so but the macrophage is a is a is a is a type of this uh, innate response cell so it rushes in and it releases these three um uh, these three uh, um, uh, sort of uh, compounds which are called sorry um uh, uh, these are signaling uh, uh, molecules called il1 il6 and tnf alpha and once these get into the blood what happens is that this blood vessel around has two kinds of, uh, it has a smooth muscle and it has what's called endothelial cells, which are like the cells that line the smooth muscle. The muscle expands, but the cells contract and there are these gaps in between, like it's a, a tiled wall where the wall has expanded, but the tiles have shrunk. And uh, there are these uh, specialized um, immune system cells. I mean, not specialized, like these are very effective uh, immune system cells called neutrophils. They rush in. And then they rush in and then there is this uh, general chaotic scene that starts to happen inside the um, uh, alveoli. Uh, the, uh, the, so, so there is this, uh, all the viruses start getting killed and uh, there is, uh, but some of uh, these cells are also dying because these alveolar cells are under heavy stress. And not only that, like uh, this uh, cell wall has become a bit permeable and this fluid and other stuff uh, comes in. So there's like pressure you know, that's uh, sort of trying to uh, compress the balloon. And on top of that, you know, this uh, alveolar type two, uh, 2 cell was producing the surfactant, which was this chemical that was essentially increasing the surface, uh, decreasing the surface tension and, and keeping this uh, balloon uh, in shape. So now it is no longer making that surfactant and all the liquid coming in drowns the surfactant and essentially your alveoli starts to collapse. So the alveoli shrinks and it collapses because of low surfactant and uh, uh, it, it has got too many things inside now, plus the water uh, and other fluids have come in and the alveoli uh, is, is not, uh, 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 a balloon is not there anymore. And as a result, like your gas exchange is also like uh, very badly uh, damaged. Uh, you know, there's less surface area for, to exchange with and the, your PO2 drops. And you uh, get, uh, you don't immediately get into this acute respiratory distress syndrome, but you get what's called increased work of breath. You have to, like, you know, breathe harder to sort of uh, breathe. So this is what the list is. It says that the macrophage is alerted by the pneumocyte, uh, release the interleukins and uh, tumor necrosis factor. And these cause the neighboring blood vessels to uh, dilate and water and fluids rush in and neutrophils also come in. And the surfactant is drowned out. There's increased fluid pressure, and uh, there are a lot of cells, and the alveoli shrinks and collapses, causing strenuous breathing, extra work of breathing. But then, what happens after that? Uh, uh, yeah. 
sorry. So the, the, uh, let, let, I'll show this first. So this is where we are in the, in the corner, like uh, the alveoli has shrunk and there's all this thing going on, but your pressure of oxygen has dropped. So there's hypoxia and that, uh, there are chemoreceptors in the body. So uh, when there's hypoxia, there's uh, also like this uh, acidosis, like your uh, carbon dioxide concentration is going up and your proton uh, concentration goes up uh, because like the way uh, water plus uh, uh, carbon dioxide creates what's called carbonic anhydrase, uh, uh, sorry, uh, carbonic acid using, uh, and uh, uh, essentially you'll have, uh, the, your blood becomes more acidic. And that is, uh, there, uh, there are chemosensors in the body and that alerts the heart and the heart thinks that it's not doing a good job. So it essentially your heart rate will go up. So now your heart is starting to beat fast. Uh, and then uh, all this uh, inflammatory chemicals also are in the blood and the blood has this region called the hypothalamus where the blood brain barrier is very thin. And then the hypothalamus senses all these inflammatory materials uh, uh, stuff and then it knows that there's a, uh, in a situation that's uh, in progress and uh, it should just, you know, focus on trying to uh, remedy it. So it sets the temperature up. So that's where you get fever, which is above 101, like 101.4. And then uh, it releases other uh, chemicals uh, like prostaglandins, which are also involved in uh, inflammation. Uh, this is where like aspirin and other things work is, is the prostaglandin pathway. So you've got the heart involved and you've got the brain involved and your whole body, there is sort of a systemic uh, inflammation that's now in progress. And, and what happens there is that like all your vessels, uh, the, as long as this uh, you know, thing is going on in the lungs, like you have got a system-wide inflammation and then uh, your heart rate, uh, your respiratory rate also goes up. Uh, and uh, your blood vessels all have become leaky. And so all the water has, is rushing, rushing out and the fluid, the pressure drops in your blood vessels. As the blood vessel pressure drops, like your kidney uh, is no longer getting blood, your liver is no longer getting blood. And the kidney, you know, releases uh, nitrogen, which is, uh, you know, a product of uh, a lot of processes, uh, including protein metabolism. And, but uh, the, your blood BUN creatinine goes up your liver is under stress and that there are certain liver enzymes called ALT, AST and acute phase proteins, um, acute uh, phase enzymes, like they go up. So essentially these are markers that there is something, you know, big that is happening. And, and again, like IL-6, which is one of the chemicals that is released by this macrophage also is, is there more in the body now. So that's also a marker. Um, but, uh, and then there is also GI distress uh, that is, uh, happens in some patients. It used to happen more in SARS patients. But, but this is like, like a, a kind of situation that's called sepsis. And now, you know, either all of this resolves, you have to resolve it from the, you know, you have to, you have to essentially resolve what's happening in the alveoli. You have to really get rid of this virus. But if this goes on for a while, like, uh, you know, if the shutdown goes for a while, like the system fails, and then you have basically multi-organ failure and death, otherwise you recover. So that's a brief overview of how the virus works. And uh, this is, uh, I just uh, wrote that down now, less oxygen is exchanged, uh, you activate the chemoreceptors, increases the heart rate, and the respiratory rate also will increase, leading to the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, and the cytokines are sensed by the hypothalamus, increasing uh, the temperature set point uh, and release of prostaglandins and the systemic leakage of fluid from the cells, a drop of uh, perfusion in kidney and liver, and um, a kidney produces extra uh, chemicals, like there's, there is more, uh, more of this in the blood. It, it's not producing it, it's not, uh, it's not able to kick it out. So that's what, uh, how, the, how this works. Now, what are the ways we can target the um, virus or, or like uh, this, uh, uh, you know, the disease, the COVID-19, which is caused by the SARS-CoV-2? So one is we can prevent uh, like this entry of the virus into the cell. So like uh, here is like the virus is trying to enter the cell and we know like the spike protein binding to the ACE receptor is a big one. If we can stop that, then the virus cannot enter the cell. And chloroquine is thought to inhibit it. Now, how it does it, nobody is very sure. Um, like there are these proteins are large, uh, you know, molecules and they also have sometimes um, uh, glucose or uh, I should say sugar molecules that are added to it uh, that change its chemical properties and so does the virus also does that and somehow 
uh, chloroquine changes the glycosylation, uh, like this uh, sugar adding um, uh, patterns in the in the ACE receptor, and that somehow could be inhibiting. But it is not very clear, and uh, and it is important to know because uh, you know why does okay. A, a, a medicine work in someone and not in uh, not in someone else like it could be like genetic variability or it could be you know uh, that's something uh, where it's important to know the mechanism but this is where the uh, uh, chloroquine works which is this anti-malarial drug that has been studied since the 1940s uh, in world war ii then the other one is uh, remdesivir uh, which is um, uh, again, uh, it, it uh, you see when the virus RNA comes in, it tries to do two things. It makes more copies of the RNA, and of course, it makes this protein. So now, if you can stop it from making more copies of the RNA, you cannot get any more virus because it has to have more copies of the RNA. And this is Remdesivir tries to block it. Again, you know, what does it do? What are the side effects? Is the body also doing RNA dependent RNA polymerase? So th this is also something to consider. Uh, but this is after the virus has already entered the cell. Then there is ritonavir. So, you know, the virus makes this long strand of proteins. It's a polymer and it has to cut it in parts. And uh, HIV and other viruses, they do all, all of the same things. Uh, so this was actually an HIV drug. And uh, so it, it inhibits this scissor, like this cutting um, machine for the protease. So if you can stop it, then again, you don't have more parts of this protein, which is like, you know, spike protein and other stuff. So you can't make any more virus. And finally, when the virus has pretty much made all of this, uh, what you are trying to prevent is the immune response, like the systemic immune response leading to sepsis and death. And that's where uh, uh, something called tocilizumab might help. It's a uh, means monoclonal antibody, but it's a it's a specific uh, molecule that can inhibit IL-6, so which is a, a major inflammatory uh, mediator. So that uh, these are the four major classes of drugs, and there are many, many more because. Uh, one of the, I mean, I will, uh, maybe that should be another presentation is like with the viruses, the way they work with the ribosome, ribosome, they trick our ribosome doing really weird stuff, uh, which a ribosome doesn't, the ribosome sort of goes back and forth on this uh, RNA strand, uh, trying to uh, read it and, and make proteins. So there, there are other targets, certainly. Uh, and uh, uh, there's blood pressure medication and everything because once your uh, you know all your fluid has gone out your blood pressure has tanked and so you need to uh, fix that uh, the other treatments depending on the stage of the disease so uh, so finally i just wanted to come back and and say like uh, uh, a couple of words about the spike protein uh, so uh, well, you know one of the thoughts that people thought that uh, people uh, you, if you take a sars virus and uh, you engineered this kind of spike protein it's in a lab for you know sort of military purposes and then it kind of leaks out and then you have this uh, terrible situation but uh, this paper that came out in nature and it has got a three million uh, views and, and many citations um, shows that that could not have been the case and uh, but we essentially it has a rather uh, like a uh, you know, frightening conclusion uh, so what it's saying is that so this spike protein has two parts like this protein if you stretch it out uh, as a sequence it has got what's called the s1 domain and the s2 domain and the s1 is this receptor binding domain and the s2 is the domain uh, that is uh, involved in the entry of the uh, into the cell but this has uh, three regions where uh, there are special kind of uh, residues called the polybasic um, basic residues so it's called a polybasic cleavage site this is where the tmpr ss2 comes and cuts it so now uh, you have this protein, we have got this receptor binding domain with this very specific, it made six changes. It made six changes and it came up with a way to bind which uh, uh, very efficiently with the ACE receptor. And plus we do not know exactly what this polybasic cleavage site, it, it, this one it just added and we don't know how it's helping the virus. So uh, uh, because SARS also used ACE binding, but SARS didn't bind so effectively, like there had been a lot of computer models trying to predict, you know, what mutations can help this spike protein bind so effectively. But our models had not predicted these. In fact, like models don't even think it is efficient, but you know, nature and, and uh, is, is uh, uh, truth is stranger than friction. And, um, uh, and, and then, um, and uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's very hard to know in a 3D molecular binding what is energetically efficient or not. And, and definitely there are other things that is involved here. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, and then, then there's this polybasic cleavage site. So now, if you take the overall sequence similarity of this whole spike protein, uh, um, that, that uh, is like 96% uh, common to certain bat coronaviruses. But could it have come from bats? No, because the bats did not have these six proteins, uh, six, uh, six amino acid residues. But just that part, now the whole thing doesn't match with what's in a pangolin, but those six residues does match with what's in a pangolin, that they have found it. But the pangolin, neither the pangolin nor the bat has this part, like the receptor binding domain, and the pangolin doesn't match anything here in the S2. So a conclusion is that maybe there was a transfer from a pangolin or in a bat to a pangolin and pangolin to human of an innocuous form of the virus that lacked this special pathogenic part at which we are trying to understand like uh, i mean the people, scientists are trying to understand like what it does and then it uh, this uh, is known to be um, like the immune system selects it in virus in virus cultures or you know uh, uh, animal like through several cycles so maybe it went it was in humans for maybe years or who knows and then uh, human immune system sort of led to this mutation and now the virus became pathogenic so that's that is essentially my presentation and uh, I actually started, uh, I know, wanted to talk to Arthur also about this. I, I wanted to put all the scientific information in a site. So I've started this, it's, it's still in the works. Um, and, and then uh, like the specific uh, uh, residue that I used, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, specific um, video that I based my um, uh, um, thing on. Uh, uh, so you, which you might see, but uh, a lot of the video is actually based on this. So just hold on. Uh, okay. Okay. So now uh, I think I can uh, um, take questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sid. Like this, this was super easy to understand. Very good illustrations and just visual aspect of it. I'm sure this will have a lot of impact on all of the teams that are working in our uh, group right now primarily because you've explained some of the core uh, kind of um, steps that are happening that were super hard to understand before, just by Googling and uh, watching different videos. I have a question <clears throat> and it, it's more related on um, the, the current treatments. So basically for, from my understanding, the current treatments and you know, producing ventilators and supporting people is mostly focused on treating the lung cell failure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what, which is really a second order effect of all the preceding actions, which are um, basically binding to receptors, entering cells, and then replication process, and then misuse of resources, which then causes the logical and expected autoimmune response to fight this bad actor. With, which then causes the lung cell failure, which then causes other third order consequences across the whole body. Is this right? That is correct. And uh, yes, so the question is, you know, for the most part, people don't, I mean, you're not, you don't know unless it's too late. That's the thing is that um, you, uh, um, this, this one works very fast. Like sometimes it, it, it can be slow, but this one, you know, makes a lot of copies fast, but or it, it has a latency period. So, you know, like how it takes four or five days after you're infected, like when the symptoms start showing and then suddenly that could be a very fast decline. Uh, the immune system response can, you know, there's something called a cytokine storm, which is uh, depending again on the, you know, immune system response, like it, it can ramp up very fast and, and, and uh, 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 you know, lead to failure. Uh, but but again, like it's just that just that you don't know again, and also like how effective these drugs are, one must be cautious about because these drugs have side effects. Uh, you can't just block proteases and uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerases. You can't uh, uh, you know change glycosylation patterns of ACE inhibitor like you know chloroquine. All of these have side effects, and then there's a genetic variability. So first of all, like uh, it's not very clear you know what, how these drugs work, but they do. Um, and what are the sites of action and who it will work with and what who it will work with, who it won't work with so their uh, genetic background and their pre-existing conditions and why is it older people like have a you know higher mortality but um, 
but then uh, it, it just it's just too late and then you have to treat one of the things with the ventilator i i should i would like to mention is the ventilator does two things you see the alveoli has collapsed and your oxygen uh, is a lot of carbon dioxide uh, which has to be pumped out uh, but the balloon has to be pumped back in so it's like a bit of a bike pump you suck it back but then you have a little bit of pressure that comes in which tries to put the alveoli back in shape because there's no surfactant so but that's what a ventilator does so that's why you need a ventilator and um, um, but yeah, I mean, like uh, early diagnosis, like if if people can be somehow, you know, caught within that five day range through some kind of a nasal swab or something, because um, the way this is diagnosed initially, uh, I mean, like, uh, you know, like you've seen those nasal swabs. So what they do is that they, they take a, a swab sample from uh, deep within the nose and then they amplify the genetic material. And then there is... Uh, it can detect the signatures of the virus through uh, this amplification process called RT-PCR, specifically QT-PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, but um, once the virus is there, you have to know like it's specifically this and not pneumonia. So what it does, it creates a ground glass opacity, like uh, it uh, creates like a kind of, uh, sometimes it's like a tile thing, like a specific pattern in the uh, chest uh, um, uh, CT scan, not chest X-ray, is, is not so good uh, in finding out. But CT scan uh, and maybe AI can certainly help there. There's something called COVID Net, uh, which looks at the CT scan and has a, it has a signature that this is this is happening. Uh, and then you may not still have hit the point of you know uh, blood pressure falling, a multi organ failure, and all of this stuff. So it depends on where you can catch it and where you can treat it. Makes sense. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the further down the line you're trying to treat this disease or effects, the higher risk factors are in terms of, you know, if you're treating the, the third order effects and uh, the effects that it causes on organs and multi-organ failure, you already have so many different factors to battle that it's almost counterintuitive to work at this stage and kind of focus the efforts of researchers to find ways to like prevent uh, the virus from actually binding to receptors, first of all, right? Um, well, that's yes and no. I mean, certainly you have to take care of everything that is going on. You have to have the ventilator and other kind of blood pressure medications and uh, other, <laughs> sorry, other, other things. But uh, one thing to remember is like, think of our country, you know, or, or, or like any any country, like you have this, situation and your country is in a lockdown and the country is hemorrhaging you know like you cannot have this uh, going on uh, so at some uh, till the situation is resolved like you have caught some, some disturbance in your neighborhood and the police have caught enough till they have caught this person they cannot let this let the uh, thing uh, in so that to you have to stop everything else but till your um, and you have to dampen the immune response uh, for people who have a very severe immune response and people where the virus has really spread but you have to you have to really kick the virus out of the alveoli and that's really your immune system and and the set of chemical um, you know drugs that has to kick it out till that is done you're not going to get better so uh, both are important i mean you have to keep the person alive with a ventilator and everything you know your your respiratory rate might be like you're clearing you're working at 10 to 20 percent of your original capacity and uh, then all of this other things start, but you have to kick the virus out. Otherwise, you know, that's it. And in terms of, because you've perfectly illustrated and simplified the forward path in terms of, you know, how virus progresses, but obviously there's, you know, ways for virus to uh, stop progressing, right? So let's imagine at, at every stage of this progress, there is uh, a chance that virus fails to bind to receptor or virus fails to enter the cell, or virus uh, fails to establish the effective uh, ribosome uh, replication, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, there, that certainly is there. Uh, though some parts of our, uh, you know, like some parts of this machinery is very well conserved. For example, like, uh, you know, one does, when does molecular uh, phylogeny, which is like comparing, say, um, the genomes of different organisms and to see like who which is the parent ancestor you should use ribosomal RNA so the ribosome is a is a machine that uh, is I mean there's not much variability in it so it's uh, 
like if the virus is not able to use the ribosome, it's not because of a different kind of ribosome because pretty much all of us have a very similar ribosome. But uh, it could be uh, some, I mean, we'd have to block basically that, uh, you can't block that. I mean, there are certain things that the virus will do. Like, you know, once it gets in, it, it, if it uses the ribosome, there is, it's pretty much, there's no two ways to that. It's going to do it. Uh, there's no variability there. And with the uh, RD uh, polymerase too. But um, yeah, I mean, some things can naturally happen due to genetic variability and some things we can stop. And the stopping is like the things specifically like the protease inhibitor or, or this RDRP. Makes sense. So can you, uh, this is Steve, I just uh, found the conversation about the drugs very interesting. Could you uh, help us kind of understand um, where they fit into the cycle of transmission? It sounds like uh, most of the, the drug, the four drugs that you talked about are about treatment. We did talk, you did talk a little bit about when in the, in the process and progression they should be applied. And I guess given that a lot of people can be asymptomatic and have mild symptoms, it seems a little tricky to decide who to treat and not who not to treat. Um, but what does it do? Do, do? do those do anything to prevent transmission or are we still looking for a vaccine and we're still social distancing because uh, all we've, the, the four drugs that you talked about seem to be more once you identify the virus then you can use those, but you still have the transmission problem that you haven't addressed, or maybe I didn't understand kind of where they fit in. And quick question, just to double down on that. Um, from my understanding and from what you've described, Sid, that hydroxychloroquine is actually one of those measures to prevent the receptor binding and could be the, the answer to Steve's question, but I, I'm not sure. So could you please cl clarify that part too? Yeah, hydroxychloroquine certainly will change the ACE receptor, uh, you know, binding properties, and that might sort of stop it to start with. But it doesn't work with everyone, and there, first of all, we don't know how it exactly works when it does. But there's some sort of a sort of molecular modification involved, but unless you know that, you do not know why it's not working with someone and why it's not. So it's not something that will effectively stop it, you know. You can't say like, you know, you have hydroxychloroquine or you don't or everybody has it. But then uh, if, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people have different genetic backgrounds and, and then the, uh, it has to reach that cell. There are there are other things like uh, I don't think like giving, you know, taking anti-malarial drugs in advance is going to uh, this one is, is going to be an effective way to stop it. And of course, like social distancing, as we know, like once the virus gets in, it's because the spike protein it's like this ball, like a tumbleweed that's kind of rolling in the air. But it, it, it can bind really, really well with the spike protein. I mean, no, no other virus uh, has, has effectively done this. Now, so uh, I think like, you know, social distancing is the best one. The one thing that I didn't mention uh, is like, uh, uh, the, so about vaccines, you know, how does that work? And, and, and uh, mm, uh, where, uh, where um, um, so, uh, the uh, body has what's called an interferon system and whenever this body knows you know with uh, our evolution that uh, different uh, um, uh, if it's a RNA that is not from yours uh, or like what's called pathogen associated molecular patterns PAMPs uh, then it will uh, it will launch specific responses I mean uh, it, it knows that you know calling the macrophage and all of the neutrophils is a big situation but it will try to resolve and then uh, it has got what's called the NF kappa beta interferon system the type 1 interferon system and it will try to activate that it inside the cell there's detection that this RNA didn't isn't one of ours and then uh, there's something else and we need to basically get rid of this virus like right now um, uh, and the virus also has learned to uh, sort of uh, suppress that so you know we, if you find that out then we might not uh, interfere with the viral suppression of our immune response uh, but but uh, but then um, that's how a vaccine works is the vaccine uh, one 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 way a vaccine can work vaccine can work in many ways that's the thing there are other cells that are involved like not only this there are the adaptive immune response that comes in which is your t cells and immune cells but essentially the t cells the uh, you've got uh, which are uh, the specific uh, specialized cells which can detect very specific patterns and then lots specific you know attacks like depending on the pathogen uh, or the or the uh, uh, invader 
So, so T cells, uh, there are helper T cells and uh, cytotoxic T cells. Uh, they essentially uh, uh, get primed by by the by vaccines. You know, vaccines can create you know help create uh, antibodies. Uh, and one of the ways to detect the virus and early detection, like if you were ever exposed, is the presence of these antibodies, which we know that uh, you know, it just shows that you were exposed, but you may not have symptoms. So, uh, so antibodies are from B cells, but the uh, but the T cells um, can. There are these what's called memory T cells. So, question is, how long does it keep the memory? Like, if you get vaccination, how long does it last? How long does your specialized T cells know uh, that uh, to recognize these aberrant patterns and, and to destroy or attack or get rid of these cells. So, so there is that part to it, which, which again needs investigation, definitely like, you know, vaccine when it comes, is it going to be effective? And secondly, you know, one of the things that I said is that this virus used one trick. I mean, the MERS, which is this uh, another type of coronavirus, very similar, but it uses binds to a different receptor. And then this virus not only bound to receptor using a conformation we didn't understand, and plus it added some other stuff to make it uh, spread better. Um, uh, I mean that it could have done in humans. So literally, um, uh, and uh, only five percent of bad viruses have been sampled. So, so like there's a whole possible scenario of things that could happen. Uh, new stuff might come. New stuff, which again we will may not have the um, uh, you know immunity to, and if we have the immunity, what kind of immunity it is, what kind of immunity can we culture through a vaccine, is again not known. So I don't know if that's uh, I got off the answer, but uh, these are the questions that you know all uh, everybody has to think of, like when they come for this vaccine. Moderna has a what's called an RNA vaccine. Uh, that seems to be a strong candidate and what the RNA vaccine does is that you can sort of bind to the RNA and you can stop the RNA. So, but, but these are approaches that won't be there for a year. That's interesting. So that, uh, hello, uh, this is Akash here. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah, yeah continue. So uh, there was the, um, some amount of uh, miscommunication. Like initially, uh, like people were saying that it, uh, it's good it's, uh, even if you don't wear a mask it's okay okay and then that uh, that understanding that we should wear a mask even if you are not uh, uh, not uh, you are not acquired a virus so uh, why was this miscommunication out there is there some uh, like some kind of a, the characteristic of the virus that is something special that it, you need require you need wearing a mask can reduce the transmission of them. So uh, one of the, uh, so the thing is that how long is this stable outside? So it's not really a living thing. You know, suppose it's a living cell, uh, which is like our regular cell. It needs food to come in and, uh, you know, stuff, you know, uh, waste, waste stuff to go out. But the virus is just a polymer with a shell. So, but, but uh, RNA is not a very stable molecule. So eventually RNA will degrade. So you can't just keep it out for too long. Maybe it has to do with the temperature and humidity. And that uh, shell outside is also, uh, you know, it can get destroyed, especially our soap can destroy. It. But the question is like, how well can it stay in the air was not known. And I, I don't know like why people, um, uh, maybe people didn't realize that this was this effective it it can really be stable outside for a very long time it can stay on surfaces for a very long time like 15 days after the diamond princess was evacuated the virus was still spreading on that when a heavily disinfected ship i mean uh so it is it is a pretty good one and there's one final thing that uh, i mean one more thing about the virus is this is no regular virus like viruses usually have small genomes and they are uh, you might have heard they mutate a lot uh, they have uh um, you know, too many errors uh, and after a while, like it just, it's just, it's useless. Like you can't make too many mistakes. Uh, you still need to have a instruction set that is making all this spike protein and your membrane protein and all that stuff. So this virus is, uh, there's the upper limit to what's called a uh, you know, viral size, how, how big a virus can get. And this is on the upper limit. And in fact, it's maybe even slightly bigger. It's 32 kilobases, which is pretty long. And uh, some of these proteins have what's called an exonucleus activity. What it does is that it checks for errors. I mean, this is a pretty frightful thing because it, it, it can check for errors, uh, which basically allows it to be big and complicated. Uh, and and so now, now the question is so it is a complicated uh, it, 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 this one is a complicated virus and then somehow it can stay uh, because 
it can survive certain mutations because of his exonuclease activity or maybe who knows why. It just stays outside for long. And, and then it, it wasn't very clear, like, why is it, uh, I don't know, like people didn't try all combinations, uh, depending on, you know, when you test it, like suppose you're testing it and then you say, okay, like this is uh, uh, present after two hours, three hours, but uh, I mean, they, they didn't come up with these advisories and these advisories are very, you know, social distancing is a huge impact on the economy and maybe people knew and, and they didn't because they didn't want to destroy the economy. I don't know. I mean, uh, definitely like it spread the way it did because of, uh, you know, lack of preventative action. Cool. Thanks. That, that was interesting. Yeah. And, and one question, uh, Amad Deep, like he, he asked, like, uh, 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 about like uh, immunity of recovered patients. So, you know, as I said that immunity, there are, uh, you know, there's this T cell mediated immunity, and then there is this um, uh, other uh, the interferon system. Uh, but uh, uh, there is a memory, uh, like you, you know, you get a certain immunity shots after some time because your immunity it, it loses the memory. Some cells, but it depends on the kind of uh, cell, like uh, 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 sort of immune uh, memory, like it can last longer. But viruses, uh, first of all, they do mutate. So if you have, these are very specific uh, responses and, and uh, if it's not matching with the, your immune system, won't do anything. And secondly, like, you know, as I was saying, like, you know, we get all these common colds and virus, this virus is kind of a common cold virus, except, except that it's learned to bind to this ACE receptor and does all these things. Uh, there, there, there are like just too many of these and with, they can do too many things. So if you try to, uh, you know, prevent a specific kind of uh, virus, like you'll have other ones coming in. So, uh, or mutations. So that's why like, how long is the immunity of recovered patients? It depends, like some people carry immune response for some time and uh, they might, um, you know, knock it out, but some people's immune response fades. So the virus, though it's mutating, certain parts don't mutate. I don't know, uh, they're, they're, they're not, this has to be a retro, uh, retrospective study later on like you know who were immune there is a there is a consortium that's studying that who were immune nothing happened then whose immunity remained who didn't get reinfected and again like you have to be exposed again so all of these factors are there do you have any other questions all right i think we're good uh, thank you so much, Sid. This this was amazing. Uh, we'll probably have to sync together to figure out how to spread uh, this information um, through, I don't know, graphics or something. And just uh, let's figure out how to deliver that because that was super insightful, super easy to understand. And it really repositioned my understanding of what exactly we have to do for all of these tasks in terms of finding the treatments, finding the, and communicating the risk factors and all of these things. So right, I think thank like you so we much. Have, we, we do have a, certainly a big task. Yeah, I, I think like, you know, there's, I focus a bit on the genetic uh, approach. And so there is the sort of uh, machine learning, AI data analysis of, you know, the genetics of the virus, the genetics of the humans. Uh, then responses then again like literature searches and then um, other like uh, data from patients so all of this has to be combined to create a idea of how to treat it and not only that how to prevent future outbreaks you know what are the possibilities what are the you know possible situations that we might have to face again so that 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 that's quite a ways i think <laughs> yeah yeah Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much. I'll be uploading the recording shortly and please message me on Slack. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye guys.